agriculture fails, and uh, Nation A has destroyed itself by launching a nuclear war on Nation B. The main consequence of, uh, of nuclear winter is uh, massive agricultural failures, and uh, many international uh, study groups have now concluded that the, uh, the net result in mass starvation can account for many billions of lives. Well, there's only five billion. How many is many? Well, hard to quantify, but you're absolutely right. It's a big fraction of the human community, and that's the long-term effect and the prompt effects. You know, you're going to kill many hundreds of millions, maybe one or two billion people in the direct consequence of a nuclear war. So it now appears that, uh, that nuclear war certainly will destroy the, the nations involved with the nuclear war, almost certainly will destroy the global civilization, and might just possibly destroy the human species. So it's another uh, calibration of how serious the stakes are these days, how high the stakes are, because of our technology. Nuclear war has put us in a position to do utter devastation to our species. Putting greenhouse gases in the atmosphere promises, if that's the right word, uh, a global catastrophe, not just uh, destruction of, uh, of farmland, uh, flooding, some places drought, other places rise in sea level, inundation of coastal cities all over the planet. That's serious stuff. The depletion of the ozone layer uh, from uh, these chlorofluorocarbon compounds lets more ultraviolet light from the sun down to the surface of the earth. Skin cancer is a serious consequence. That's the one we hear mostly about, especially us light-skinned people. Uh, Dark-skinned people are much better protected against it. But the more serious aspect of it is that the ultraviolet light attacks the, the little one-celled plants that are at the base of the food chain. You know, those are the guys that the next guys eat, and the next guys, the next guys. Eat. And way up at the top of that ecological pyramid, there is us. And we're ultimately eating the one-celled plants that have been processed through lots of intermediate uh, plants and animals. And uh, so, again, we're messing around with uh, the global environment in a very serious, very stupid way. And uh, we just have to get our technology in hand. It's not enough to say that, uh, that uh, corporations can do whatever they want as long as they make a profit, not if they're putting at risk people all over the world. They can't. There has to be a new way of approaching this. And we can't say that one nation can do what it wants within its borders. Because, as I said before, what you do in one country's borders has consequences all over the planet. Well, we're going to talk, be talking about space exploration, too, and uh, not just all gloom and doom. But while we're on the subject, <laughs> what can the average person... I mean, that, I think a lot of average people have heard a lot about this as the environmental and nuclear threat have been pounded in and pounded in, and we're, at CNN continue to uh, raise the, the alarm cry. But what can the average... Uh, what can the average citizen do about it? Uh, because that's really, a sense of hopelessness is not something that uh, you want to convey or that I want to convey. What can the average citizen do to affect changes on the part of, uh, of our government to, 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 to make the moves that are necessary? See, I, I don't think it's hopeless uh, at all. As I said before, uh, humans are good at figuring stuff out, and we're good at change. We've had a lot of changes. What in can our, in the viewers history. of this program do to make a difference in correcting these problems? They can make sure that candidates who don't understand and aren't deeply committed to ending and reversing the nuclear arms race, to stopping greenhouse warming, and to uh, stopping the depletion of the ozonosphere, that those guys aren't, men and women, are not elected. It's not enough to have a candidate say, I'm an environmentalist. In what way are you an environmentalist, Mr. or Ms. Candidate? Take a look at the, the most recent election. Uh, there we had a candidate who... Uh, said that he was an environmentalist. He, in contrast to the previous eight years, where we had an uncompromising anti-environmentalist in the White House, okay, now there's a president, Mr. Bush, who at least acknowledges that there's a problem. We didn't even know that from, from listening to Mr. Reagan. But if you look at Mr. Bush's budget, we see not a hint of any real commitment to the environment. So I, I say in a democracy, that's, that's the most important thing a person can do. There are a lot of other things a person can do. You can plant trees. Every individual can plant trees. That's something that's very constructive. You can boycott industries which are irresponsible 
on global warming and on chlorofluorocarbons. There are many things people can do, but they have to understand the issue before they can do those things. Well, we just had an election. We won't have another one for a couple of years. Uh, do you do you have uh, any faith in, in writing letters to your congressmen and, and senators? A lot of people believe that that has some effect. Uh, I think that it can have some effect. Uh, there's a multiplier effect because so few people do write. Those who do, the right. congressional staff says, hey, there must be 10 or 100 times as many people who agree with this letter but who haven't written to us. So that's, that's important, but, uh, but that's not nearly enough. People have to inform themselves. They have to understand these issues, and this then relates to the whole problem of, uh, of Americans not understanding science, not understanding mathematics, not being able to read, not know geography. I mean, we're in very bad trouble if we don't understand the planet we're trying to save. Carl, you've been um, involved with the space program for the last 30 years in a very major way. What do you think are the greatest benefits that have uh, accrued from our expenditures and our exploration of space? There's a huge number of them. Um, one is uh, satellite communications. I mean, the, this conversation is uh, being broadcast uh, all, over all over the world largely via communication satellites. They sit up there, they go around the Earth as fast as the Earth rotates, so they hover over one spot, and so you can send a message to one of them, and back it comes down to a different part of the Earth, and it binds the Earth together. It's a very powerful political fact that there's a different way from what we were talking about before, in which technology is binding the Earth together. Another uh, aspect that I think is tremendously important is those photographs of the Earth alone in space, fragile, blue world, in this vast blackness, this vacuum, velvety vacuum of space. And it's, it's clear, it's a very thin atmosphere. It's so sensitive to the depredations of human beings. You look at that and you say, hey, that's only one little world. We don't have anywhere else to go. No other planet in the solar system is a suitable home for human beings. It's this world or nothing. That's a very powerful perception. Uh, then, in, in the particular field that, I, uh, that I'm involved with, uh, the exploration of planets, by, usually by robotic spacecraft, uh, there we have opened up a, a universe of wonders. We have looked close up at uh, dozens of new worlds, worlds that we never saw before. And uh, unless we're so stupid as to destroy ourselves, there are going to be people exploring those worlds. There are going to be human habitations on those worlds. We're going to be moving out into space in the next century. Uh, and uh, I'm fortunate enough to have played a role in the first preliminary reconnaissance of the solar system. That's a terrifically exciting thing. Then there's the fact that uh, when you study these other worlds, you learn about this one. It's a very important fact. If you look at uh, the individuals who played key roles in uh, discovering the uh, threat to the ozone layer, the increasing greenhouse effect, nuclear winter, you find a very high uh, preponderance of planetary scientists uh, working in there. People have cut their teeth on other worlds and then come back to examine this one. By comparing our world with other worlds, you can see a lot of things that can go wrong. Venus, for example, has this immense greenhouse effect. Surface temperature is hot enough to melt uh, tin or lead. Anybody who says the greenhouse effect is, uh, is just some fantasy, all I have to do is look at Venus, a very important object lesson. And then there's one more, there are a lot more, but there's one more in particular uh, kind of uh, advantage of space exploration that uh, I would stress, and, uh, or of, of space technology. And that is military reconnaissance and treaty verification satellites. If you don't know what the other side is doing, then the standard uh, military prudence is to assume the worst, the worst case. That means you then build up your armaments for the worst that they possibly could do. They see that you're doing some of that, they do the same, and you have a nuclear arms race which is absolutely catastrophic with our present technology. The satellites tell you what's actually happening there to remarkably high fidelity. So it calms the hotheads and paranoids on both sides. And that's worth its weight in gold. So put all that together. Plus weather satellites, they save billions of dollars in, uh, in crops every year just from knowing what, what bad weather is happening so farmers can take precautions. Um, the space program has paid for itself many times over. And uh, none of this, of course, has to do with putting people up into space. 
There may be good reasons for doing that, historical reasons, uh, social reasons, reasons for building bridges with other countries. I'm, for example, a strong advocate for uh, a long-term joint U.S.-Soviet program to put Americans and